All right. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. And I would like to thank the organizer for this, put together this nice workshop. And uh, I'm honored <laughs> to give the first talk of this workshop here, okay? So, um, <clears throat> all right, so this talk is about uh, this project, Mass Rigidity for Asymptotically Locally Hyperbolic Manifold with Boundary. So this talk is based on joint work with Lan Shen Huang. It's one of the organizers of this workshop, okay? And yeah. Uh, okay, all right. All right, so here's the plan. So um, uh, as the title suggests, is the main object we're concerning is uh, asymptotically locally hyperbolic manifold. So I'm going to define uh, this uh, object in rather precise manner. And uh, the, the next, I'm going to talk about this, the definition of mass integral of asymptotically locally hyperbolic, since we are interested in uh, knowing this rigidity phenomenon, okay? And then I'm going to talk about main result. Uh, this, uh, in short, we can say mass minimizing ALH metric must be static. So um, while I'm defining those uh, one and two, this, I'm also going to explain this, what it means to be uh, static. And uh, the, the mass minimizing, I'm gonna uh, introduce that uh, condition as well, okay? And uh, in the main result, uh, to prove that, we need these two main ingredients about setting uniqueness result and the scalar curvature deformation result. So uh, after I uh, talk about main result and its implication, some remark, I'm going to talk about this main two main ingredients. Okay. All right. So the first, I want to talk about the definitions. Okay, so to define this asymptotically locally hyperbolic manifold for our purpose, we need to uh, state this, uh, talk about this reference manifold, what we are going to use, okay? So here we fix some K, number K, K is negative one, zero, and one. So um, this reference manifold, as you can see here, we are defining as product manifold. So this interval from RK to infinity cross N, so we need to fix some this geometry of slice and the, the number K, which stands for like a curvature of this uh, slice. Okay, so we're considering this NH, uh, which is an N minus one dimensional closed manifold. And we define this uh, N dimensional product manifold with the metric given in this form. And here R K, R sub K equals zero if K is zero or one and R sub K equals one if K equals negative one. So this simply wants to prevent this having zero in the denominator, okay? And we'll call such manifold as a reference manifold. Okay, so uh, this looks exactly like a hyperbolic manifold if you put uh, K equals one and H as a standard sphere metric. So that's where it comes from actually, okay? And uh, letting this uh, coordinate change S equals this function with R, then the metric B uh, can be written in this form. So by multiplying positive function S square, you get this uh, compact manifold. So the infinity can be extended uh, uh, after the conformation. So this shows that the reference manifolds are conformally compact. Okay, so there are some facts about this reference manifold. So uh, it is well known that this metric B ha has asymptotically constant section of curvature negative one. Okay, so uh, when R approaches to infinity, then the section of curvature uh, will become negative one uniformly. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> if the slice metric NH is Einstein with this constant, then the MB, the reference manifold, uh, will be. Uh, Poincare Einstein, which means that it's conformally compact, and Einstein with this negative uh, Ricci curvature. Okay. Um, and in this setting, this slice NH will be called the uh, conformal infinity. Okay. More precisely, one, one can put this conformal class of H, but uh, it's not important. Okay. And such manifold is often called the Birmingham Cothman manifold as well. Okay. And if the slice 
this uh, metric has constant section and curvature k, as I said, we're fixing k means uh, curvature of the slice, then uh, MB has constant section and curvature negative one. And we say such reference manifold is locally hyperbolic, okay? Right, so those are reference manifolds we're going to consider. And so uh, there's more description about this here. So uh, when we use geodesic polar coordinates, then we can see uh, a little more about the properties, okay? So when K equals one, then uh, by that simple coordinate change using function T, one can write down this as a geodesic polar coordinates. And uh, if NH is the standard uh, unit sphere, then you can see this MB is exactly the standard hyperbolic space. And this can be extended at T equals zero as one point, right? So, and... So sorry, this is uh, it's a just complement, right? There's no boundary. Sorry, the typo. Okay, and uh, when k equals zero, one can use this uh, coordinate change t equals l and r. Then uh, you're gonna get this uh, metric form dt squared plus e to the two th, which uh, makes this uh, hyperbolic cusp. Okay, uh, but uh, we have this hyperbolic cusp with expanding end as well. Okay, so uh, for our purpose, we are going to use this hyperbolic cusp as our infinity, not this finite volume example. Okay, and when k equals negative one, then uh, one can also make certain coordinate change. Then you can find this metric B equals dt squared plus cosh t squared times h. So this metric B can be extended from the range t for the positive number to this uh, whole real line. Okay, so if you remember this, when we use R coordinates, it's defined from one to infinity. So in that case, you only have from zero to infinity. But after we use this geodesic polar coordinates, this, uh, you can find the trivial extension using this T here, there. Okay, and the extended manifold will be uh, this two isometric uh, locally hyperbolic ends. And there's a neck here when t equals zero, uh, it's, it's gonna be minimal surface. So this means that uh, if you remember this uh, metric form, dr, dr square over r square minus one plus r square h, um, it seems like uh, it's gonna have singularity when r equals one, but it's actually not the geometric singularity. It's, it can be extended up to this boundary as minimal surface. So that's the reference manifold, all right? So by using that as our uh, infinity, we can define this concept asymptotically locally hyperbolic manifold. Okay, so we are going to consider a smooth connected and dimensional Riemannian manifold uh, and it's called asymptotically locally hyperbolic and this rate Q and asymptotic to the certain reference manifold. And if there exists a complex at K, and the diffeomorphism from uh, this set outside of this compact part, diffeomorphism there, and this error tensor E has DK rate Q, and we also impose this scalar curvature, weighted scalar curvature integrability, okay? Right, so uh, in, in this talk, we're gonna assume that Q is greater than N over two uh, because that's a necessary condition for this mass integral to be well-defined, okay? Right, and also this uh, scalar curvature integrability is needed for that purpose as well. Okay, so this is gonna be the definition of ALH manifold we are going to consider today. All right, so now I'm, I'm going to move on to the definition of mass integral, okay? So for that, uh, I have to talk about this concept, static manifold here. So uh, in, for the GR people, this definition is a little different, but uh, the equation, is, equation part is equivalent. It's just a boundary condition and sign condition is missing. So we're gonna use this as our static manifold, okay? So, um, okay, to talk about static manifold, uh, it is operator. So the first LGH, we are gonna use that. LG as the scalar, a linearized scalar curvature map, and LG star is the former L2 joint of that LG. Okay, so uh, it looks like that. Okay, 
And the definition of setting manifold is here. So Riemannian manifold is static. If it admits a non-trivial solution V to this equation LG star V equals zero. Okay. So uh, such V is called a static potential. And uh, this, there's a fact that a static manifold has constant scalar curvature. Okay. Uh, locally constant scalar curvature. Okay. So it, it's going to have constant scalar curvature for each connected component. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And if a reference manifold is Poincare Einstein, then it admits a static potential with this function. So if you remember, this is the uh, square root of this denominator function uh, in, in the metric form, right? Okay. So there's also related fact here. So uh, for k equals zero and negative one, and we also assume that this reference manifold is locally hyperbolic, then kernel of this, uh, the LG, LB star is going to be uh, spanned by this one function. Yeah. Okay. And for k equals one, and if we assume that MB is the standard hyperbolic space, then this kernel of LB star spanned by these n plus one functions. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to define this mass integral by using this concept. So uh, we name this as the one crucial Hosling mass integral. So uh, it's defined by this uh, Sheldon Wang's paper and crucial and Hosling's paper. So we use this name and it's defined as the following. Okay. So uh, if we have this ALH manifold asymptotic to MB, then uh, we define this mass uh, related to the static potential V. And uh, that's as a limit of this uh, flux integral with one form plugging in normal vector. Okay, so here V is a static potential of MB and UV is the one form uh, it's given by this way. Okay, so here we use E again. That's a different tensor of the metrics. And uh, nu B is the outward union normal vector. Okay, so this one form uh, can be uh, there's actually physical motivation using Hamiltonian formulation and everything, but I think uh, this one is more geometric way to see it. Okay, so when you have a function and this symmetric to tensor, you you can evaluate this linearization uh, like this way, v times l b e and l b star v e and pairing them with metric b, and when you look at the difference, then you get this uh, divergence uh, form of it. So this UV, one form UV is uh, take it out of this divergence form here, okay? Right, so if you think about it, this LB star is former adjoint. So if you take the integral uh, this uh, with the compact support, then you're gonna get zero. So uh, you, it is not very surprising to have this divergence form, right? Okay, all right, so. Uh, this is one example, a uh, non-trivial example of uh, ALH manifold. So uh, it's called the generalized Copley metric. So here uh, we fix uh, slice NH metric as a, a constant Ricci curvature metric. Then uh, we, we can define the metric uh, with slightly different denominator function there, okay? So uh, this manifold is also the product manifold with this interval cross n, and r the largest zero of this denominator function, okay? So uh, this manifold is ALH with uh, rm cross n as boundary, provided this rm is greater than zero, okay? So if rm is like uh, less than or equal to zero, then seemingly you're gonna have coordinate singularity, but, uh, all right, and this turns out to be static manifold with static potential with this one. And if you compute the mass of this metric, then you get this uh, parameter M here. Okay, so I, I should have mentioned this. Uh, M is some parameter we, we can choose, okay? So here we are considering this normalized volume. So if uh, volume of NH is not equal to one, then you're gonna see some volume. Term here. Okay, that's all. 
All right. So the interesting part is that when k is negative one, then uh, this uh, necessary condition Rm greater than zero that can be achieved with the parameter m less than zero. Okay. So this uh, natural example will produce negative mass example when you assume this uh, slice uh, metric has negative curvature. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, so uh, we can choose either way. So the reference manifold can be Poincaré Einstein or locally hyperbolic. Right. So, so uh, we are not restricting ourselves as a the reference manifold being locally hyperbolic only. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. All right. So uh, since we defined this uh, mass integral, so I'm going to review some, uh, remind some positive mass results related to that. Okay. So k equals one case. Uh, people work with this uh, standard hyperbolic space as a reference manifold. Okay. Then uh, we call this. Uh, all right. This uh, m n g asymptotic to h n as an uh, asymptotically hyperbolic manifold. So we are kind of distinguish it from uh, locally hyperbolic case because this is a special example. Okay, there's no L, right? So, okay, so uh, if I remind the fact about static potential Hn, it's going to be spent by this n plus one function. Okay, so the mass integral we uh, normally consider is this n plus one vector. P naught uh, is mass integral with the this function and pi defined with this xi. So maybe I did not, I think I didn't explain what xi is. So that's a, a the coordinate function about this polar coordinate, a hyperboloidal chart. Okay. All right. And this total mass mg is defined as uh, this Minkowski norm. Okay. So at this stage, we don't know this is going to be positive or not. So that's why we put square. For technicality, okay, but it turns out to be that's uh, positive, so we can define mg by taking uh, squared positive squared. Okay. All right, so uh, this uh, is done by many other people here. So, uh, but in some uh, to sum up, we have this conclusion. So, if we have n-dimensional AH manifolds. Uh, we have dimension restriction or a spin and uh, this scalar curvature lower bound there. Okay. And if M has a non-empty boundary, then we assume that this uh, boundary has mean curvature less than or equal to N minus one. Then uh, we have this uh, equality, uh, inequality here. Okay. And if M has no boundary and equality achieves, then uh, we know this is going to be isometric to HN. Uh, that's actually part of the our work. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So the uh, I'm going to mention that later. But this, uh, if I tell you just uh, in brief way, is uh, if you have a non-empty boundary with this mean curvature condition, then mass must be strictly positive, yeah. All right, okay. All right, so uh, there's also known uh, positive mass result when k equals zero case. So, um, but uh, I wanna mention this first. I think I didn't say this one, okay. So the reason why we consider this uh, complicated total mass is that each p not p are not geometric invariants. That means you can choose different coordinate and it's gonna change the numbers. But if you use this Minkowski norm, it's gonna be fixed, okay? So that's geometric invariant, okay? But in k equals zero or negative one case, then uh, just only looking at this one quantity will produce a geometric invariant, okay? And for the case uh, k equals zero, following positive 
mass theorem is known. So it's done by crucial gallowing and pets. So it has a uh, dimension restriction here, three to seven. Okay. And, uh, the reference manifold is somehow fixed. So this, uh, the, the slice geometry is being a flat torus. And uh, also they consider this product manifold form. Okay. And uh, we have this closed uh, interval at one. So it's going to have boundary in, uh, when this value has one. Okay. And we also suppose that the boundary has mean curvature less than or equal to n minus one and scalar curvature lower bound. And when n equals three, uh, they need to assume that the mass aspect function has a sign. So that's another assumption. Uh, but this is not our focus today. So I'm not going to talk about mass aspect function. Okay. And in this case, the inequality is now mgr is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So the rigidity statement is not proved by they, their paper. So uh, in our work, this rigidity statement will be proved there, okay? And uh, for the case K equals negative one, there's no positive mass theorem. As I told you, we have this generalized cotton metric having negative mass. So positive mass theorem doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, but there's this nice theorem about the uh, Penrose inequality in three-dimensional case. So when K equals negative one, uh, there's uh, for, ALH manifold has uh, having negative mass has the lower bound determined by area of boundary. Okay, so the penalty inequality is known, and they use uh, inverse mean curvature flow, and they also prove this uh, rigidity statement there as well. Okay, right. So uh, that's the about this positive math result about ALH case. Okay, now I'm going to mention this uh, main result. The mass minimizing ALH metric must be static. Okay, so to talk about this, uh, we're gonna start with the static reference manifold with uh, static potential V naught. So uh, from Dan's question, we're not assuming that MB must be locally hyperbolic. So uh, we, we can uh, prove that statement with uh, just Poincare Einstein, okay. right? And an ALH manifold uh, asymptotic to this reference manifold with non-empty boundary, we're going to consider that. And uh, to state our uh, mass minimizing condition, uh, we need to talk about the space C L alpha negative Q is weighted holder space. Okay, so it uh, has regularity, holder regularity, but uh, in addition to that, it's going to satisfy this DK condition. It decays to zero at the rate Q toward our approaches to infinity, okay? So now we can state our uh, first theorem, okay? So suppose that MG is the local mass minimizer in the following sense. So uh, there's an open neighborhood U in this uh, affine bottom space. Then, uh, then for any gamma in that open neighborhood with this, scalar curvature fixed and the, the boundary metric and mean curvature will be also fixed, then the inequality, uh, the math inequality is true, okay? All right, then the conclusion is that MG must be static with the static potential V satisfying this condition. So V is asymptotically behaves like V naught, okay? Right, so, uh, uh, I emphasize here this with, with color. So uh, that's about uh, this constraint of this mass minimizing condition, right? So we only looked at this mass minimizing condition when this gamma satisfying this condition. So scalar curvature is gonna be fixed and the boundary geometry is somehow fixed, okay? Right? And this type of uh, constraint uh, space is also considered in uh, this Lee Lesor Ungar's paper. So um, for, for their uh, equality case proof, right? So that's our first result. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. For, 
for that, I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, this uh, we're gonna upgrade this condition, boundary condition, but uh, not this one. Yeah, so in this paper, but I'm not sure that's possible or not. Okay. About the scalar curvature. Okay. Any? <laughs> That's not upgrade, right? <laughs> okay, all right, all right, okay. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Right, so that's the first uh, theorem. So when you have this constraint space and if uh, the mass is minimized in that, then we get the static metric. Right, so uh, for the second mass minimizing result, uh, we need this upper bound function H naught uh, that can be constant. We're gonna use constant function later, but uh, uh, for the sake of generality, we can use H naught, some function. Okay, so um, theorem two is like, uh, goes like this. So we have this uh, constraint space again, open neighborhood, uh, but we have this H naught dependency and uh, scalar curvature constraints still there, but the mean the for the boundary geometry we don't have any restriction on this uh, in, uh, induced metric on the boundary, but the mean curvature can decrease. Okay, so and uh, in that constraint space we want this uh, inequality to be true. Okay, then uh, first conclusion uh, we still have the aesthetic potential because uh, as you can see we are enlarging our constraint space. So we already have static potential from theorem one, okay? But the reason why we consider this is that we want to have more property on boundary about static potential and geometry. So uh, if one assume this uh, minimizing condition, then we can also derive the other three condition there, okay? So this, uh, this number two is that we have this uh, interesting relation with uh, second fundamental form and static potential and its normal derivative, okay? And uh, using maximum principle, we can also show that V greater than zero everywhere, uh, so including boundary, okay? And uh, sigma has mean curvature exactly equal to this upper bound function H naught, okay? So later we're gonna replace this H naught as constant function N minus one, then as you can see, the second condition will become this V equals uh, normal derivative of V, and the uh, second fundamental form is exactly the uh, induced metric of G. Okay, so uh, we want to have that stronger result to get to use the static uniqueness uh, for showing the rigidity. Okay, so together with the static uniqueness for ALH manifolds of mass zero, like this here. Okay, we have the following result. Okay, um, so the condition is this, so we have ALH manifold and it has mass zero and is a mass minimizer in the following sense. So uh, if M has no boundary, then uh, we have this, we only have this scalar curvature constraint. And if M has boundary, then we also need uh, the mean curvature condition and that uh, the, the, minimizing with a constraint, two constraint condition there, okay? Then it turns out this uh, reference manifold has restriction. So K must be one or zero. So K equals negative one cannot have such minimizer, okay? And uh, this MG is isometric two, these two Ks. If K turns out to be one, then MG must be isometric to standard hyperbolic space. It also implies that M must not have no boundary, okay? And when K equals zero, then it's gonna be a Birmingham Kotler metric with uh, cutting out this in one uh, surface there, okay? And whose conformal infinity is reach flat, okay? So the mean curvature upper bound we are using N minus one, uh, if you remember, this is related to the condition from positive math result, okay? 
Right, so a couple of remarks uh, here. So theorem three uh, actually generalizes the equality case of PMT for an AH manifold to, to the case with non-empty boundary as I answered to Ryan, right? So uh, if AH manifold has a mass zero, then it cannot have non-empty boundary with uh, this mean curvature condition, okay? Right, and this theorem three also implies that for K equals negative one, then there's no such local mass minimizer, okay? So if you think about this locally hyperbolic manifold uh, whose boundary is determined like this, then this is a reference manifold. So certainly this is a mass zero, right? Um, but this uh, boundary satisfying this mean curvature condition, the, this minimal surface. So it's not, it, it cannot be the mi minimizer in that setting. Okay. So the, uh, we have this model space, but it turns out that model space is not the lowest mass example. Okay. And uh, when k equals zero, um, the lower bound of the mass, including boundary list ALH manifold is actually not known. Okay, so uh, um, uh, moreover, there is a known com complete ALH manifold called the uh, horowitz myers gions uh, and its, its mass is negative, okay? Right, so the positive mass results for k equals zero case uh, only have, uh, it's only true, it's only known when it has a uh, boundary. Okay, so I wanna talk about some uh, idea of proof here, okay? So uh, we're gonna use this variational approach. So uh, this is uh, Reggie uh, Tyrebaum functional, right? For a hyperbolic setting, okay? So for a fixed function V, uh, we can consider the following functional is mass minus this uh, total scalar curvature difference, okay? And we are using V as weight in there, okay? And uh, if we recall the mass minimizing condition in theorem one, uh, we are considering this, uh, the affine bound space and constraints with the scalar curvature and the boundary, in boundary induced metric and mean curvature there, okay? So uh, this, uh, if you see this, uh, this star mass minimizing condition implies that the functional f v naught achieves a local minimum at g with those constraints. So this type of constraint minimization scheme is used to show the space-time equality case and also space-time equality case with boundary by this uh, little sir Unger paper, right? Okay. Right, so um, once we have this functional and this uh, constraint minimization condition, then we can apply the method of Lagrange multiplier, provided that our constraint operator is surjective. The linearization of constraint operator is surjective, okay? So that's related to the scalar curvature deformation result, okay? It's one of the necessary ingredient and most technical part in our paper, I think, okay? So I'm, I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, I'm gonna postpone that at the end of the talk, okay? And uh, if one use uh, the method of Lagrange multiplier, then one can find this uh, element in the dual space uh, that satisfy this condition, okay? With this uh, boundary constraint as well, okay? So if one compute this uh, linearization of that uh, functional, then uh, from the integral, um, we can use divergent theorem, then you can pick up this term and also boundary term, okay? So this boundary term uh, with this constraint, as you can see, this uh, linearization of mean curvature part zero and this, uh, the induced metric H, uh, induced tensor H on sigma is gonna be zero as well. So boundary integral vanishes. Okay, right, and now we compare this uh, with this uh, right-hand side term, then you get this equality. Uh, this, these two integrals are equal, okay? 
So this means that lambda is a weak solution uh, to this equation, LG star lambda equals minus LG star V naught. Okay, so uh, by moving this to the other side and adding them, then we can see this is a static potential. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Right, so about the theorem two, uh, if I remind this mass minimizing condition there, then uh, it's going to look like this. We have this constraint space, uh, scalar curvature fixed, but mean curvature can decrease. Okay, so uh, as I briefly said before, this minimizing condition implies star, the minimizing condition in theorem one, we already have a static potential from that, that argument. Okay, and once we get the static potential with that asymptotics, we can actually uh, replace this mass quantity with this uh, the function, the static potential we just found, V, okay? Right, so uh, now we want to show this additional properties there. So to show the additional properties, we consider, uh, we can consider a differentiable path of ALH matrix. So uh, with uh, the first linearization equals H. Uh, so uh, if that, uh, differentiable pass fix this scalar curvature as constant like this, then uh, by direct computation, we can, uh, uh, we can compute this derivative of mass with this uh, pass of G, okay? Right. So uh, it's basically the same as uh, this one, this one, but we are using static potential V, so that's why this is gone. So this uh, boundary term only survives, right? Okay, so the derivative of mass is actually uh, determined by this boundary behavior, okay? Right, so uh, here, uh, so I just uh, rewrite this, that formula, okay? So if, we didn't prove it yet, but if there exists such a uh, differentiable path of ALH metric GT with arbitrary uh, this quantity, the linearization of mean curvature and this HT, then one could construct the mass decreasing path of ALH metric unless we have those three conditions. Okay, so the first condition you can easily see that, uh, ignore this one for now. Then when you can see this, if this is not identically zero, then you can choose HT to make this uh, integral ha having uh, negative sign, right? So we need that. And using maximum principle cleverly, you get this, uh, this static potential positive everywhere, including sigma. And if uh, mean curvature is uh, not, ident not equal to H naught exactly, then we can uh, like, perturb this dh so that we have a uh, negative derivative of mass, okay? Right, so for that purpose, we need this uh, surjectivity of such map. So this is a linearization of scalar curvature and the uh, induced metric on the boundary and the linearization of the mean curvature, okay? So we need this surjectivity to construct this differentiable path, okay? Right, so this idea actually has been used in uh, Anderson Jarigi's work. So uh, the similar argument was used to show that the burdening mass minimizer must be static. So they also construct some uh, mass decreasing path of asymptotically flat metric so that uh, you know, the, the burdening mass minimizer is not static, then they can construct the uh, <clears throat> the negative derivative of mass, okay? All right, so uh, that was, that were the, uh, those were the main results. Now I'm gonna move on to the ingredients of the proof, okay? So at, uh, in the main theorem three, we use this static uniqueness result for ALH manifold of zero mass, okay? So, uh, it goes like this. So if you have the static reference manifold 
uh, and conformal infinity has type K, then, and we consider this, uh, the static manifold, okay, and uh, positive static, static manifold, uh, which is positive in interior M, and mass is zero, and uh, this M has non-empty boundary sigma, then uh, we want to assume this condition. So second fundamental form is uh, equal to induced metric, and uh, the static potential uh, on the boundary is equal to its normal. Okay, then it turns out K must be zero or one. K equals negative one cannot uh, satisfy these three conditions. Okay, and if K equals one, then uh, you get the standard hyperbolic space. So that means M must be bounded at this. And K equals zero case, you get this uh, Birmingham cotton metric with boundary. Okay, and conformal infinity must be Ricci flat. Okay, so uh, here's some notes here. Uh, as I said, this, this result implies that the for k equals negative one, there does not exist such static manifold satisfying those assumptions. And uh, the assumption three, this umbilic condition and the static potential, uh, the behavior, they also can be derived from the conclusion of theorem two when this, uh, upper bound function is constant n minus one. Okay, so the idea of proof is that uh, using this identity is uh, uh, discovered by uh, Shen in 1997. Okay, so when you have the static ALH manifold with boundary and static potential V there, then uh, one can compute this integral with this right-hand side. So we have mass term, and the right-hand side is uh, some boundary integral, second term there, okay? So from the hypothesis, uh, one can show that this, uh, we assume mass is zero, and the boundary condition, this umbilic and uh, V equals nu V, that makes this uh, boundary integral vanishes as well. So if right-hand side is zero, then we get uh, this, in this equality. So the uh, positive static potential must satisfy this Hessian equation, okay? So this Hessian equation uh, is studied very well. So uh, there's a classical characterization of complete Riemannian manifolds that admits a non-trivial solution of this Hessian equation. Uh, so we extend that with boundary case, then uh, it turns out we have this uh, nice, the desired uniqueness, okay? Yes. Is there actual mass in the integrand part? Is that exact number here in the original identity? Uh, yes. So uh, it's it's not in one form. It's in the like uh, the after we use diverse theorem. So the, as, as you can see, this is integral over M. So yeah, so, so yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So integral over M and use, uh, and manipulate a little bit and use divergence theorem, then you pick up this and this one. Yeah, that's actually the, exactly the reason why we have the boundary integral. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's move on. All right, so that was a static uniqueness result. Very brief uh, comments. And now I'm going to talk about scalar curvature deformation result uh, that we use in our proof. Okay, so uh, this the very kind of famous uh, problem. Uh, given a Riemannian method, and we try to perturb the scalar curvature, then uh, when can you achieve that, right? So um, I just, uh, write down some um, selected work about this. So all those are uh, the, uh, all those are, all those use this uh, implicit function type arguments. So they studied this linearization of scalar curvature map. So it started with this uh, fisher Marsden in 75 on closed manifold and it's generalized by Corbino's work. It's uh, 
compactly supported deformations and crucial delay of uh, developed like a systematic approach on this like in a different function space. And Corvino Shin use a constraint operator and this Corvino Huang, they uh, use a modified constraint operator. Okay. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, this uh, in 2020, we uh, proved this uh, asymptotically hyperbolic rigidity. We also show some uh, similar type of uh, argument there. Okay, so uh, in this line of research, we show this uh, similar type of deformation result for an ALH manifold with non empty convex boundary, considering two different types. Okay, so the first type is that uh, the metric gamma uh, converges to G toward boundary exponentially fast. Okay, and the second one is. Uh, we just assign arbitrary Bartonic data, the sufficiently small arbitrary Bartonic data. Okay, so in our paper, we define this function space BL alpha. So um, this is not the technical definition, I'm just giving a description about it. So we uh, consider this weighted space, uh, controlled behavior near infinity, and we add more. Uh, near the boundary. So this is comparable uh, to this exponential uh, decay function, okay? Then uh, we prove this uh, some kind of surjective, surjective statement, okay? So given any scalar function f inside of this, then one can find this uh, symmetric to tensor h in that uh, weighted space with C2 regularity, and this LGH achieves this f, okay? So now linearization have certain surjective uh, uh, tastes, so we can find this uh, nonlinear surjectivity as well. Okay, so uh, the method we prove, uh, the method we use uh, to prove this statement is that we consider this type of PDE. So uh, this one, this type of PDE is uh, set up by Corvino in 2000. Um, and uh, to solve it, they use this uh, variational argument using this functional, then the uh, euler lagrange equation is this uh, differential equation, okay? And for this to work, uh, we need this uh, coercivity estimate for, to control this one. So having actually minimum of this functional, right? Uh, but in general, this uh, one cannot expect this to be true because uh, if the metric admits non-trivial static potential, then the, it must be, uh, uh, this uh, doesn't make sense, right, in, in that case, right? But in our case, the static potential for an ALH manifold cannot be in this weighted space we are working on, okay? So, uh, for, uh, to do that, we analyze this uh, static equation uh, carefully. So it turns out that static uh, potential must be uh, the converges to zero near infinity, or it grows linearly in certain cone. Okay, so uh, the uh, goes to zero case, we can use maximum principles. So uh, we can exclude that and it grows linearly that's uh, excluded by this weight, the choice of weight, okay? So uh, that's why we are not gonna have aesthetic potential inside of that weighted space, okay? And the uh, deformation is a two. So we show this uh, surjectivity of this map, okay? So when you're plugging in the symmetric to tensor uh, with this decay there, then uh, we get this, uh, okay. So uh, this, there should be weight here, negative Q, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and the uh, uh, linearized uh, scalar curvature operator. And the second one is induced, met, induced symmetric to tensor and the linearization of mean curvature. Okay. And uh, if one have that surjectivity, then we can also have this uh, nonlinear version of surjectivity there. Okay. 
All right. So uh, in our proof, we use this um, uh, this yeah the theorem and uh, the result by this uh, Anderson jerry is here. Okay. So uh, it's there's known uh, surjectivity of such uh, such operator. So it's in 19, but they all, they only showed in three dimensional case. Okay? So we have to generalize the full general uh, dimension. So that's in, uh, that proof is in the appendix of our paper. Okay, so then we use cutoff uh, nicely to control this uh, boundary and uh, the infinity uh, at the same time, okay? So uh, I think I don't want to uh, bore you with all the details. So, uh, the, so we use this um, gluing part. So uh, to control this boundary, we uh, take out this infinity from ALH and uh, instead we glue this flat end there. Okay, then we use this, uh, the surge activity from anderson jarigi type, then control this sigma and cut off that part again. And then we use our, uh, the surge activity argument we already proved to control this infinity. Okay, so that's how we get it. But uh, that's just one way to prove it. But, uh, maybe one can prove more direct, one can prove the surge activity more direct way. Yeah, I think I think that might be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that might be possible. Yeah. 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 So okay. So maybe I explain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So uh, we start with some uh, function f. So uh, we want to get LG f, L L G H equal f. And we want to, uh, we are looking for the solution h for that. So we pick f there. So, and to control the boundary behavior, uh, we consider this auxiliary function f naught, which is exactly f in this neighborhood. And uh, outside of this u1 is zero. Okay, then um, from the result in the asymptotically flat setting. So uh, now we, we, so we consider F naught, uh, which is zero outside of U1. So we can throw out the infinity and put this flat end somewhere here. Yeah, but that boundary doesn't assume any uh, condition, right? So they, it can behave whatever you want, okay. It's already zero in F, F naught, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so we, we don't need to control this part, right? So that's why uh, we do not concern it here. Yeah, that's right. So we're not controlling this condition there. Okay. Then from asymptotically flat setting, now we have asymptotically flat manifold with uh, boundary sigma and some boundary uh, from this uh, throwing out part, but we do not concern it. Okay, that's, a, that's not important. Uh, there's no assumption here. So we, we just picked some large outside one. Uh, Sigma has mean curvature condition, right? Uh, mean curvature is less than n minus one, yeah. Oh, uh, the trajectory does not require any, yeah. yeah. Say again? Oh, just uh, like a uh, connected some way. There's no curvature condition. That was the, yeah. Yeah, that was the key part, yeah. So the gluing, uh, uh, we don't have to be careful about it, just, just putting it. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, just uh, we just need the uh, the boundaries uh, compact. Yeah. Right. So then, uh, using this F naught, we can find this uh, H naught using this flat setting. Okay. Then uh, we do not know H naught is compactly supported or not, so we cut off again using cutoff function. So uh, this we cut off this H naught, but this um, the, the this computation is local, so we still have this. Uh, what we want in the small neighborhood near boundary, okay? And we consider this function f minus the, uh, the, the, the computation of this, then you get zero near boundary neighborhood and outside of this u2, this big, this, this one outside of u2. So now we, we are going back to this, uh, the, asymptotically locally hyperbolic setting, okay? So then this is exactly F, all right? Then uh, since we have this uh, zero near boundary, the neighborhood of boundary, and uh, this function is F outside of the, the large neighborhood. So it, uh, it satisfied the DK to be in this B, okay, all right? And exponential decay, we have surjectivity, we already proved. So that's why we get this H1, okay? H1 with this function, with this function as our inhomogeneous term, okay? Then we can move this by using linearity. We have this H1 plus NIH naught. Theorem four, uh, that, that was the, the surjectivity that we, uh, I think it's theorem, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Right, so using this uh, surjectivity in flat, using flat end, we control this neighborhood. So then uh, using linearity, you can put them together, then we have uh, what we want, okay, All right? And the boundary condition is linear, so this, so here our setting is using this uh, somehow Dirichlet and Neumann type, but uh, uh, this boundary condition is actually linear, so we can claim that the surjectivity works for arbitrary boundary condition as well, okay? Right. Okay, so that's all for my talk. Thank you for your attention.